Welcome to Forum at 360. I'm Madeline Baxter. Today on Forum at 360, three KTOO reporters share and discuss recent stories examining poverty and opportunity in Alaska. They pursued stories on the role of Alaska Native corporations in their shareholders' lives, the challenges of limited childcare in the capital city, and impacts of new biomass boilers and greenhouses in a rural community. Their reporting is part of WNET's Chasing the Dream Project. This is the second time KTOO has participated in the grant-funded multimedia reporting project. Chasing the Dream highlights stories about economic mobility and pathways out of poverty around the nation. Joining us today are KTOO reporters Julia Caulfield, David Purdy, and Jacob Resnick. Welcome to Forum at 360. So part of your reporting involved producing videos on what, you, what your stories were about. So Julia, can you tell us a little bit about your story and how you went about pursuing it? Yeah, so the story that I was looking at was how native corporations can help in the economic mobility of their shareholders. And so we wanted to zoom in on one particular family and what their experience has been. So I was speaking with the Sobolev family and just getting a feel for what their experience through several generations was um, in regards to the Sea Alaska Corporation specifically. And so in the video, we see Sasha Sobolev, who was an original shareholder, uh, talk about his experience along with Ros uh, Rosita Worrell, who is, has worked with uh, Sea Alaska for a number of years and is now the president of the Sea Alaska Heritage Institute. Well, that's great. Let's take a look at your video. Do Alaska Native corporations help their shareholders climb the economic ladder? After three decades on the Sea Alaska Corporation's board of directors, Rosita Whirl recently retired. I can't believe I was on there for 30 years because it went by just that fast. In 1971, President Nixon signed the Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act, or ANCSA, into law. Sea Alaska is one of 12 for-profit regional Alaska Native corporations the legislation created. It also created many other village corporations. Alaska Natives at the time, like Whirl, enrolled as shareholders. And I think most of our people, our shareholders, believe that Sea Alaska is not just a business corporation, although some people tend to think that that's its sole responsibility. Sasha Ivan Sobolev is an original shareholder in the Cake Village Corporation and the regional Sea Alaska Corporation. I asked him if he felt like Native corporations generally can help people with economic mobility. No. Why do you say that? Because the business nature of Angstka Corps, which is uh, the formation of an economic vehicle called a profit-making business, is not the way the culture of southeastern Alaska natives, or even natives anywhere in the United States, thinks or exists. I barely even recognize, except a couple of times a year when they give out one or two hundred dollars, but it, it doesn't set the standard for um, making a culture come alive. It doesn't recognize where you live, the lands that you are, that your clans and your, your families have had for years, that where you pick berries or where you go fishing or where you, you dry the foods that are, that are going to be due or whether you're going to have seaweed come. It doesn't do any of that. However, some native corporations do support nonprofits focused on culture. For example, Rosita Whirl is the president of the Sea Alaska Heritage Institute. In addition to our um, uh, economic responsibilities uh, through employment and dividends, we also have a host of other uh, responsibilities and uh, things to meet our mission objectives like um, scholarships, uh, internships, things to grow, help our grow uh, our, our shareholders so that they could leave, lead a a, a healthy lifestyle. Worrell says she'd like to see Sea Alaska advocate for more subsistence rights for its shareholders. Subsistence is really important to us economically, but it also has other dimensions that support our cultural beliefs, our, 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 our idea of caring and sharing resources with one another. So I, I'm not saying that we have to, you know, go back to a hunting and fishing economies, but I want to see us move forward. And I think Sea Alaska is critical to this moving forward in a way that brings us into the 21st centuries, but also uh, allows us to sustain our traditional cultures. 
Rosita Worrell and Sasha Sobleff are just two voices among tens of thousands of shareholders in more than 200 Alaska Native corporations. Do you have a story about how your corporations affected your family? Share it at ktoo.org slash chasing the dream. So like you said at the end of the video there, they're just two people talking about this topic. Did you find in the course of your reporting uh, that the opportunities based on Alaska Native corporations vary based on where you are in Alaska? Yeah, so I think it is important to note that I was speaking with a few people who have experience with Alaska Native corporations and every single person is going to have a different experience. Um, and something that both Sasha Sobolev and his uh, nephew, Nathan Sobolev, what they both said is, as people who grew up in Juneau, uh, it's a bigger city, their experience is probably going to be very different than someone who's growing up in a smaller community. And so both of them felt like the dividends that come from uh, the corporations don't do a huge amount or haven't done a huge amount for their economic mobility, but someone who is living in a smaller community um, might feel differently about that. Mm -hmm. uh, so what were some of the challenges that you encountered when you first uh, had the initial ideas for the story and went out to report? Well, one of the things that we were initially looking at was how do corporations help with economic mobility? And pretty quick off the bat from both Sasha and Nathan, um, both said that they didn't really feel like that was their experience with their corporation. And so kind of reframing and rethinking, well, so then what is the benefit of being a part of these corporations if you're not getting that? economic benefit and what Nathan was talking about that I thought was really interesting was for him it's that connection to the land that the corporations own this land in Alaska and by being a shareholder you are you own part of that land and as native peoples he was saying that that was really important to have that that connection um, and then likewise Rosita Worrell was also saying that the even from the beginning, the, she said Congress and the leaders who were part of ANCSA, she didn't think saw corporations as being the be all end all uh, for financial support for their shareholders. It's a part. And then figuring out the ways that the corporations can benefit their shareholders in other ways. She mentioned in uh, internships and scholarships that can help their shareholders um, in advancement of economics but also culture. It's so interesting and it's such a difference from the experience of native communities in other parts of the country where corporations are not really a thing. Uh, so what would be next for you in this story if you were going to take this as your starting point and go forward with reporting? What, other, what else interests you about it? Well something I think is interesting is through the generations because you can pass your shares along or shareholders can pass their shares along the how many shares one person has is probably going to be is going to diminish you're going to have fewer shares if you're uh, not a, an original shareholder nathan was saying that he is planning to pass some of his shares along to his children but then as those are broken up they might not have enough shares to pass along to their children and so i think it's it'll be interesting to see and talk about well then what does that mean how do corporations engage with Native peoples who maybe are not shareholders themselves but are descendants of shareholders. And see Alaska does have open enrollment and so they're trying to work with it that way. So people who maybe don't have shares but are uh, direct descendants are still able to become a part of the corporation. Yeah, there's a lot more to investigate about this. Uh, David and Jacob, do you have anything that you'd like to ask about this story? Uh, anything that you see reflected from your own reporting? Which which village? Is, uh, we were seeing some some village shots in, there in the in the in the footage. What what village was that? So that was footage from Cake, which uh, Sasha Sobolev, when he when Anxa was passed, he was teaching in Cake at the time, and so he enrolled in Cake Tribal as a village corporation, and then also Sea Alaska as a regional corporation. So what you were saying in some of the smaller communities, um, the dividends from the sh from the shares can be more a larger portion of people's income. The same way that the, the, the permanent fund dividend check can be. 
Right, exactly. And something that um, Nathan Sobolev also spoke about, he is part of the Kutsnu Corporation in Angoon, and he was speaking about um, a project that they're, as the corporation is working on, uh, with hydroelectric energy so they can help lower the cost of energy for the people living in Angoon. Um, as a corporation, it's not in that way a direct dividend, but it is still creating um, a company or an organization that will be able to help increase the, um, lower the living costs of the people living and their shareholders in the community. Mm -hmm. It's a really interesting story. I'll be interested to see if further reporting results from it. Um, so David, you uh, looked into the issue of childcare in Juneau, Alaska's capital. Uh, it's an issue that's been talked about at length locally, but very few actual solutions seem to have been proposed. Um, so what did you find in the course of your reporting? Well, I think, <clears throat> I think the reason solutions are challenging is it uh, does just come down to money. Um, there's a lot of creative things people are doing. Uh, that would be interesting to look into, but uh, for a lot of people in a lot of situations, um, there's this gap between uh, how much it costs to provide good child care and how much parents can pay. Um, and parents do a lot of things to try to work with this situation and make the best of it that they can. Um, one of the parents that I spoke to, uh, who's in the video, uh, actually had to quit her job and it ended up having some pretty long-term impacts on her career. Um, because she wasn't able to find childcare. Mm -hmm. It's definitely a story that has uh, mirrors in the rest of the country as well. Uh, let's go ahead and watch that story now. So you're trying to work full time, you gotta pay your rent, and then you gotta pay daycare, and you know, everything else we need to survive. Um, it, it's almost like you might as well stay home. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, because financially it's a struggle if you don't qualify for assistance. Chloe Abbott was working full time, but when her son Tristan felt unsafe in daycare, she couldn't find any other available childcare options she felt comfortable with. So she left her career with the state and found a job where she could bring Tristan along, cleaning apartments during the week. On the weekend, she worked as a server while Tristan was with his dad. And still that didn't make up for the, the break I took in pay, even between those two part-time jobs. And I lost my retirement because I needed something to make up for, you know, I had a car payment, I had rent, you know, bills, I had to get food, you know, lights, I mean, all those things, you know, are really expensive here in Juneau. When a working parent can't find daycare or childcare for for their children, you know, they're gonna miss work. Like, and if they can't find safe childcare, um, like me, they might have to quit their job, you know? And, and, you know, a lot of us are working towards a career. We have a goal in mind. We're trying to build retirement. You can do a kitty cat one. Parents are faced with this dilemma of, well, I can get a job, but it'll cost me almost all my earnings uh, to pay for childcare. For my, for my child, so I stay out of the workforce. And then those jobs go unfilled, and that worker is, yeah, instead of having an opportunity to work and provide for their family, they, uh, they, don't, they don't benefit from having a job, adding income to their family, and also providing a safe, um, uh, high-quality intervention for their kids. So that's, that's the real dilemma. So there's definitely work to be had if we had opportunities for them to enter the workforce. Recently, with Tristan in school, Abbott has been able to return to her career. Now that he is old enough to spend a little bit of time on his own, I can still work full time, but it took quite a while for us to get where we're at right now and me to get back into the career I want to be in. So what were some of the challenges reporting this story? I'm particularly interested in how you found Chloe Abbott as your main subject. So I talked to a lot of parents, I put the word out on Facebook, and, and had a lot of good conversations. Um, it's obviously not something everybody is comfortable talking about on camera for a statewide audience. Um, fortunately, Chloe is willing to. Um, what's interesting is the number of parents who 
have come up with different solutions around this. Um, I, I talked to several people who had actually opened childcare facilities in their home, uh, sort of smaller, uh, smaller groups of kids that they were caring for as a way to kind of split the difference that they would have to leave work, but they were fortunate enough to have a home where they could make up some of that income by providing childcare for other kids. Um, and obviously some people, um, like Chloe Abbott are not able to do that. Um, and her story is one of the, an illustration of kind of some of the long-term impacts that can have, that if you have to stay home from work to take care of kids, that doesn't, that affects your income at the moment. Um, and she talks about also having to drain her retirement accounts, but it, it can also kind of longer term impacts on your career if you have to take time out uh, to watch kids. And then that's uh, contributions to the economy that maybe aren't being made by people who are, who are experts in their field or are becoming experts in their field, um, but can't work in their field because they have to take this break in the middle. Have you seen much of a local discussion? Uh, I know even politically in Juneau city government, have there been talks about uh, increasing access to childcare? There's been a lot of talk about it. Um, I mean, Brian Holst, who is also in the video, is on the Economic Development Council and is also on the school board. Um, and he's an advocate for finding a way to provide assistance with childcare to, to people that need it. Um, I think the, the big challenge is it really just does come down to it's expensive to run a child care center. <laughs> and one of the things that's, that's interesting is that these in-home child care centers don't actually scale very well to, uh, to larger facilities. Um, I've, I've talked to a couple people who started with an in-home uh, center with just a few kids made it work and wanted to expand it, but found that as soon as they had a commercial space that they needed to be renovated and they were paying a lease on, that they just couldn't make it work anymore, that there was just too much, too much money going out and not enough coming in. And a lot of people who run these, these facilities don't really treat it fully as a business. Uh, a lot of them are parents themselves and they're sympathetic to the situation parents are in and so they don't they're reluctant to just raise their prices as much as they have to to cover their costs, let alone raise them to what the market will bear, because they see and they know how difficult it is to, to pay for that. Um, so it's a little bit, it doesn't quite follow what you'd expect from a simplistic view of supply and demand, um, partly because of that, because I don't think a lot of people are, are in it for the money. I don't think most people provide childcare because of the business opportunities. Um, they provide it for, for other reasons. They enjoy what they do, or they think it's a service to the community. I'm sure there's exceptions, but the people that I talk to seem to realize they could raise their prices, but still didn't want to do it. That's really interesting. And Jacob, as a city government reporter, uh, you've covered there was an initiative over the summer to create, a, I believe, tax funding. There was an initiative that was brought to the, to the city and borough of Juneau. Um, basically to use some of the city sales tax revenue to expand capacity of existing um, child care centers because the, the more professional child care centers here in Juneau, they have really, really long waiting lists. Uh, an example is the one in the federal building. I can't remember how long the waiting list is, but it could be, it could be depending on the, the age of the child, it could be months or even more than a year waiting and also they give they give priority to federal employees because they have the, they use the federal government space that's kind of part of the deal they have there so if someone just coming into the community uh, is really the, at a huge disadvantage so the initiative was to use uh, sales tax money to expand capacity for these kind of professional types of arrangements that don't like you said scale very well it's really hard start startup costs and unless you have some help um, many uh, many working working class, uh, families just can't afford it. Uh, ultimately, there's a political decision that they didn't want to raise taxes uh, to pay for this, or they also they didn't feel it was appropriate to divert sales tax money, which is used for capital projects, for building for building infrastructure uh, in the community. They didn't want to use that for childcare because if you don't raise taxes, the money's got to come from somewhere. So. It, the initiative didn't go anywhere, but I expect it will probably be coming back because this isn't the first time. It's, this is a conversation that Juno's been having for, I'm told, at least 15, 20 years. Absolutely, yeah. So David, with your reporting, do you feel like there's an obvious next story, a next step that you wanna go? Um, I really wanted to dive into some more details on exactly what the costs are for these childcare centers. Um, anecdotally, from talking to people, the big ones are space and people. 
um, that it's expensive to rent space in Juno because there's not a lot of it, and it's expensive to hire and retain uh, good childcare workers who are experienced and, and know what they're doing. And e even with average wages for childcare workers being significantly below average, um, it's still a big expense. Uh, so I'd like to break that down to a little bit more detail, what all the pieces there are. Um, I'm also interested in looking at some of the creative solutions that people have come up with. Uh, for instance, there's a co-op um, daycare center that you know parents come in and, and volunteer some of their time, and I'm interested in looking into different approaches to lowering the cost and people who are thinking outside the box. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Creative solutions. Yeah. Uh, well, Jacob, you and David both visited Prince of Wales Island, and you did actually two stories there with some interesting community solutions to local problems. Uh, tell us a little bit about the community you visited. We went to a pair of communities in Prince of Wales Island. Uh, we visited Kaufman Cove, which used to be, it was a, a logging camp that in the last, I think, 15 years or so, it's transitioned to more of a retirement slash holiday sort of place. But there also are a lot of families with uh, school-aged children who are trying to make a living there because it's just such a, such a beautiful spot. And there's so many recreational opportunities and just some of the best kinds of rural Alaska living can be had there. We're also in Thorn Bay, which is also a very similar kind of community. And uh, this, these communities in, in Prince of Wales Island have the same challenges a lot, of, a lot of rural Alaska has, which is high cost of energy and also it being a veritable food desert. I mean, uh, even in Juneau, uh, which is on the main uh, uh, barge lines, fresh produce, you know, it's, it's not as cheap as it is in the lower 48. And a head of lettuce in Thorn Bay costs literally twice what it costs in Juneau. And uh, the school superintendent there, when he got there, he found that the, the diet was very poor. Uh, as far as as far as fruits and vegetables, um, they've got great, great subsistence: fish, protein, uh, deer, that sort of thing. But they did not have a very balanced diet, and so he wanted to do something about that. Okay. Well, the first story we're going to watch is about biomass bo uh, boilers. So let's roll that tape now. On Prince of Wales Island, four schools have switched their diesel-based heating systems to wood-burning biomass boilers. 197, so this boiler's, they'll be warm when we pop her open. It takes a lot of wood to run the boilers, and the schools hire community members and students to prepare the fuel and keep the boilers running during the school day. So every hour and a half, I come out when, when I don't have a hurt foot. But, uh, I come out and then add wood uh, into both boilers and record uh, the tank temperature, always keeping it above 150 to keep the school warm. It's not a huge financial savings. You know, on the initial purchase, we're saving money on wood, but then to have students and community members man it, um, we break about, you know, about the same uh, that we'd be paying for diesel, and yet all that money staying here on the island, going to local entrepreneurs and going into the pockets of students and community members. So we feel like that's a huge advantage over anything else. So before we play the next tape, uh, I'm just wondering, how did you initially hear about these stories on Prince of Wales? Like you said, it's a pretty remote community. Well, we were looking, I was always looking at communities that have, you know, the same, looking at creative solutions to like systemic challenges, like, like energy and um, Prince of Wales is like, some people call it the wood basket of Alaska. It, it was, it, it's mostly covered by Tongass National Forest. Um, commercial forestry has been in, in decline uh, for a couple decades there, although there is some coming back now, and uh, imported fuel is very, very expensive there. And so this community was able, the school district was able to figure out a way to hire local people to cut wood, and so they're, they're using their heating, and as we're going to see in the next clip, uh, food production using a local energy source. So even if it's not a dollar to dollar savings, um, I talked to the Forest Service and they were saying the, the, the rough estimates are for every dollar you spend locally in your community, you generate about two and a half dollars of, of economic activity. But if you're buying diesel, all that money is just exp is, is leaving your community. So what those boilers are using, they're, they're paying local families about $200 per cord to deliver the cut wood uh, to run the school. So it, it, it helps uh, local employment and it keeps the money running locally. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, let's watch that greenhouse story also right now.
In small southeast Alaska communities, fresh produce can be hard to come by. I would say we've always got great sources of protein between fish and deer and, and other game. Uh, so that's really nice, but you know, a lot of it is, is processed and, and uh, canned goods that we, we can get uh, here. All right, good morning, guys. Good morning. So today we're going to focus on planting some carrots. Yay! Uh, Students in four schools in the Southeast Island School District help run greenhouses growing fresh vegetables, and some also raise chickens for eggs. These are carrots, and we'll hopefully harvest them in maybe a month, and we'll put them into our lunches. And if there's extras, we can sell those to the community or give them away. Many of the plants grow in hydroponic trays with their roots in water instead of soil. Some of the advantages can be less disease um, and some less pests. It's easier to heat the water for us than it would be to heat the soil. So you can get better growth um, and get the nutrient, just only the nutrients that it needs when it needs it. Um, and so you can, you can achieve faster growth using the hydroponics. The water circulates through a tank of fish, which provide natural fertilizer for the plants. Without the fish, the plants would die, and without the plants, then the fish would die. It has to be a perfect balance, because if there's not enough plants, then there's too much ammonia, or if there's not enough bacteria. Getting students involved at every step is key to the project. If kids will grow it, they'll try eating it. I mean, they'll try a Brussels sprout if they grow it. A lot of my focus is trying to change that, the eating habits. Years ago, Birch became convinced of the importance of food in schools when he saw a breakfast program dramatically improve early morning attendance. The vast majority of our students are on free reduced lunch, you know, that, uh, and we've just made a decision that we feed everybody. We don't deny anybody, and we don't charge anybody for, for meals for kids. So it's a very remote community. I'm interested in hearing about what it was like for you two traveling there from Juneau. What is, how does one get to Prince of Wales? You've got your choices. You can go by float plane, you can go by airplane, and you can go by the Inner Island Ferry. Uh, we tried the float plane, ended up on the Inner Island Ferry. Um, they do have some, uh, so, some, some barge service, but for, for the most part, things are flown in or come in inter very <coughs> inter intermittently. So, like we were saying before, the, everything being imported, it raises the cost there. And um, the amount of people, families who are on the poverty line, federal poverty line, is, is, is quite high there. There's very little economic opportunity. And you know, if there, logging jobs do come up, usually it's skilled loggers who are coming from outside. And then that just drives up, drives up the local cost of housing. So there aren't a lot of opportunities really uh, for local, fa I mean, local families. Uh, and I was gonna say, so they don't have a lot of disposable income that can buy the expensive fruit, uh, fruits and vegetables. But the, one of the ideas behind this program, we were told, is just to change the, ha the eating habits. Um, if, if, a, if a kid grows up used to eating fresh vegetables, salad, that sort of thing, you know, when they, when they leave, go to college, something like that, and they go to the grocery store for the first time, they'll be in the habit of, of feeding themselves with that sort of thing. But if you just grow up eating tater tots your whole life, um, even if you, if you move to another community, probably that's all you're going to know. So the, they're hoping to kind of instill this. It's part of the education and nutrition to, to get kids who aren't normally exposed to this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting because it's something I've, I've seen reported about cities where food deserts are very prevalent in many places. And this is a kind of similar situation, but on sort of the opposite end of the spectrum in a way. Um, and what you were talking about with uh, things arrive by barge, and that's how they get access to their food. Uh, do, is there a local supermarket that people typically go to? Is it what yeah. does that look like? I mean, every community has has its local market. Mm -hmm. the, the, a lot of them have small markets. Um, I mean, even the bigger communities, it's it's not a huge supermarket. Um, it's a grocery store. A lot of the communities are also really far away from each other. It can be a couple hours drive. So even just because something gets to the island, doesn't mean it isn't still expensive to get it out to the smaller communities. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I know. Uh, Obviously, in these two examples, there's a lot of successes. I mean, that it's pretty amazing to see these two programs built up from the ground. But uh, what are some of the challenges that they're still facing? A lot, actually. And they were very frank about the challenges. I mean, w when we started researching this, it was during the summer holiday. 
And uh, so school was out. So when we, we, we ended up coming in, they had just had a large aphid infestation in Kaufman Cove that killed off their entire lettuce crop. So they were just doing the, you saw the carrot planting in there. So, you know, the salad that was serving the salad bar in that video was imported lettuce. That wasn't from the greenhouses. But they, I mean, they have had that production. They're just ramping up this. This program has been kind of cobbled together piecemeal with, with state and federal grants. And so we're told this is actually the first year where the, the greenhouses will actually be operating at design capacity. Um, yeah, but they, like I said, they're very frank about their challenges. Uh, hydroponics is a very finicky system. If you get the, the chemical imbalances wrong, uh, you kill your crop. If you get with a, with a fish, if you get that wrong, you can kill your fish, and, and, and they've, they've done that. So uh, it's a lot of trial and error, but uh, Cody Boyce, the, the coordinator you saw in the video, he's very upbeat, and, and he just says basically every, every time we have a, some kind of failure, it's, it's a learning experience for the, for, for the kids. And as long as there's that sense of ownership, which we seem to see firsthand that there was a lot of enthusiasm, um, it's, it's successful in that, in that respect. Mm -hmm. And what did you find with the kids, with uh, their involvement? I mean, they certainly seemed enthusiastic from the greenhouse video, but uh, were, was it getting them more interested to eat their vegetables because they had a hand in growing them? Did you find that at all? I, I, think, I think so. I, I asked uh, one, one kid which vegetables he liked to eat. He actually named a couple of vegetables I had never even heard of. Um, th there was a lot of enthusiasm. I think just any time that you create something out of your, the fruits of your own labor, um, there, there's that enthusiasm and also just getting out of the classroom and being able to move around. There's a combined curriculum they have one of the classes we saw in Thorn Bay. Was it, it was nutrition, it was it health, PE, and agriculture, like all, you know, because they're carrying around bags of fertilizer and they're learning about nutrition and they're learning about agricultural practices. So, I mean, they, they really combine everything in there. And, and those kind of very, very small schools which have a very uh, small faculty, they have to be cr pretty creative with their, with their curriculum. Mm -hmm. Were there any other takeaways that uh, you, either of you had um, in terms of next steps for these communities? I'd, I'd like to go back at some point. Uh, one thing that was missing in our reporting, um, I mean, it was just because of time constraints, was we saw the, the schools and they threw open the doors and we had pretty much unfettered access, but we didn't have time to actually spend any time with, uh, with any of the children and their families. I would like to know what, what they're eating at home. Um, and, and, and see what, what eating habits are like that. Uh, it, was, it was alluded to in the video that the, the eating habits, that the breakfast program was bringing kids in. So in a lot of homes, you know, th things, things, were, uh, things were challenging seasonally, I'm, I'm sure. But they have a lot of subsistence fishing and hunting and things like that. But it'd be, it'd be very interesting to see what, what, the, what kind of fruits and vegetables are on the, on the table at home. Right. And a lot of the greenhouses are still ramping up. Um, they haven't had a full harvest uh, in some of them, and it'd be interesting to see kind of how much food they do produce and what kind of impact that has once they're once they work out the bugs and get things get things up and running fully. Work out the bugs, literally. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes literally, yes. Yeah. Um, and then my uh, last question, I think, Cody, who seems to be the idea man behind these, is he a native to? Is he grew up in that community, and where is no, he? No, actually, recent? he. This is his first year. He. Oh. His, pre his predecessor had just, had just uh, left uh, over, over the summer, but he comes from a long-standing uh, agricultural family in the Matsu Valley. And so he, he grew up with, did a lot of FFA, Future Farmers of America, and things like that. So he was no novice to, to, sm to Alaskan agriculture. That's all the time that we have. Uh, again, we've been talking with KTOO reporters Julia Caulfield, David Purdy, and Jacob Bresnik. Uh, thank you for joining us at Forum at 360. I'm Madeline Baxter. Funding for Chasing the Dream is provided by the JPB Foundation and Ford Foundation. Support for Chasing the Dream on KTOO comes from Thread, advancing the quality of early care and education in Alaska.